Kingdom of Sweden. Government, Unitary Parliamentary Constitutional Monarchy. Ruler, Gustav V, with Prime Minister Per Alban Hansen. Area, 176,000 square miles. Population, 6.3 million. Military, 300,000 men, 13 light tanks, 17 armored vehicles. From the Renaissance era to the Napoleonic Wars, Sweden was a massive power in the European world. They had territorial control for much of Denmark, Norway, Finland, the Baltic States, Pomerania, and in northern Germany, as well as some small colonies. While Sweden was a large power, as is usual with the world, old empires fall and new ones rise. Sweden was hit by a wave of incompetent rulers, competing nations with larger population, and long bloody wars which saw its empire fall apart losing Finland in 1808, Pomerania in 1815, and Norway in 1905, leaving it a shell of a great power. But Sweden was still a powerful nation overall, and both sides during World War I and World War II sought to use its mineral and military wealth to their advantage. During the First World War, Sweden suffered pretty heavily. The nation was and had been very trade-oriented, with exports being the main driver of its economy. Both Britain and Germany were vital players in this trade, as Germany was her primary importer and Britain her primary exporter. Sweden suddenly became aware of its dependency on other countries. The economy was built on exports, not just of iron and timber, but also of food products, primarily pork and butter. Sweden was not self-sufficient and imported one-third of its grain from Germany, as well as colonial products such as coffee, tea, and spices. Unlike in other countries at the time, the populace didn't radicalize to a large degree, even though revolution spilling over from the ongoing Russian Revolution was a serious concern. A series of measures to increase public welfare programs and diversify the economy was initiated by the new government in 1918, in an effort to prevent Sweden from being struck by the same level of hardships should another similar war happen in the future. The domestic strife during the latter end of the war also led to a constitutional reform. This reform did not just implement universal suffrage, but also a change in the balance of power between the Reichstag and the executive branch. With the creation of the Ukensrinstandam, a committee for foreign relations, the Reichstag controlled foreign policy and would levy time again and again as to whether or not Sweden should abandon her neutral policy. The support for abandoning the policy largely disappeared within the 30s, once economic depression hit the nation. They reduced military spending, dropped the raised army to only four divisions, and shortened training programs, which would only see an increase once war had reached Sweden's doorstep. While the nation was able to maintain its neutrality during the Second World War, it was a difficult process. The first challenge came during the 1939 Winter War between Finland and Russia, where Finland pleaded for military assistance. 8,500 Swedish volunteers crossed the border to help Finland's defense, but the Swedish government officially did not become involved aside from sending food and clothing as humanitarian aids, the next challenge came in April of 1940, when Germany invaded Norway. Sweden remained neutral during this, but as both neighbors became involved in the war while Germany controlled the Baltic Sea, Sweden was virtually under a blockade and was unable to conduct business with any foreign nations except for Germany. Before the war, nearly a quarter of Sweden's exports went to Britain and less than a fifth to Germany. After the German invasion, trade with Britain became impossible as the German navy blocked the entrance to the Baltic, and eventually nearly all goods firmly dis designated for Britain went to Germany instead. The primary export and one of the main reasons for the Norwegian invasion was so that Germany could have access to Sweden's high-grade iron ore, which was needed for steel production. Once France and Belgium fell, however, the direct need of the iron ore wasn't as critical, as scrap iron taken from the occupied nations fueled the war machine in a much better way than pure ore did. However, the collection was not optimized anywhere near as much as it could have been, and so the reliance on ore was still strong. Beginning in late 1940, Hitler pressed hard for Sweden to align itself with Germany. Sweden appeased some of the demands and even allowed German troops limited use of the rail system, but refused to openly befriend Germany. As the war went on, pressure came from the Allies as well, for they viewed Sweden as a prime location to launch air raids against Germany. Sweden stayed in a hard spot for most of the war. Germany had control of Denmark and Norway for the whole war, and Finland was the only non-occupied neighbor. However, they were a German co-belligerent and allowed German army divisions to be deployed in their lands during the invasion of the Soviet Union, even actively participated to a certain degree. After the occupation of Norway and Denmark, evacuees that had crossed the border were eventually trained into military units. 
with 10 battalions of Norwegians being trained and ready to be on the field by 1943. The Danes had one brigade that was trained in Skana. They all started to build fortifications along the border with Norway, as none had existed as part of the Norwegian independence negotiations in 1905. The government of Sweden pressed hard to keep the difficult neutrality. To deter invasion by either Germany, Britain, or Russia, the Swedish government sp significantly increased the size of its military budget and the military overall. More than 10 times the pre-war defense budget was allocated, and the production of tanks, aircraft, and arms skyrocketed as the war went on. Conscription was enforced, and by the war's end, Sweden had over 1 million men under arm, a sixth of its population. The only other nation to achieve this ratio during the whole war was that of Finland. Meanwhile, freedom of press was limited in order to prevent Nazi or communist propaganda from swaying the Swedish population in either direction. Nevertheless, world events could not be kept totally from the population. Just like how some volunteers crossed the border into Finland to fight the Russians, some joined the German military, including membership into the SS. Some volunteers also went to Britain to fight for the Allies. Although neutral in official stance, Sweden swayed back and forth throughout the war and offered assistance to both sides of the conflict. However, the country did remain unchallenged by either side, therefore avoiding the war that devastated so many others during this era. After the war, Sweden offered her industrial base and strong economy to help rebuild Europe that long years of war had virtually destroyed. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about Sweden during the First World War, click here for the episode I did about that. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys next time.